Today I'm going to talk about nutrition care for children with chronic kidney disease. Our objectives are to outline the components of nutrition assessment in the pediatric renal patient, list the main nutrient recommendations that most people think about when you hear renal diet, uh, describe the <clears throat> multiple contributing factors that can lead to poor growth and poor nutrition status in this population, and my main emphasis is going to be to identify or just kind of highlight that the needs of each child is going to need to be individualized. There's just not one blanket renal diet or renal treatment. So first I want to talk about etiology of chronic kidney disease in children. <clears throat> I know in adults it's more common that you have hypertension or diabetes and this causes kidney failure. Sometimes people might, you know, OD on nephrotoxins, but in children it's a different story. Uh, it's caused by congenital abnormalities or birth, you know, birth defects. The main causes I've listed here, um, the top one, renal aplasia, hypoplasia, dysplasia, basically is just saying you have underdeveloped kidneys, abnormally developed kidneys, or no development of a kidney. Obstructive uropathy can either be a functional obstruction, so the tissue's not working as it should, or it's actual anatomy, so it, it just developed in an odd way. Um, focal segmental is uh, autoimmune type disease that results in scarring, and it could lead to other things like reflux. Uh, polycystic kidney disease, we do have some kids, but it's a smaller population. Most of these kids have um, congenital anomalies. So we'll get into the nutritional aspects of it. So the the golden standard guidelines are from the National Kidney Foundation. It's the Kidney Disease Outcomes Quality Initiative. Uh, short, um, what do you call it? Acronym for that is KDOKI, which I'll be using for the rest of the presentation. And their guidelines recommend basically that you follow up with any child that has chronic kidney disease or risk for chronic kidney disease twice as often as you would a healthy child of the same age. Uh, and another thing I wanted to mention that in this population there are many potential errors in nutrition assessment we would traditionally use for children just because of the metabolic um, or anatomy differences in these children. A couple, a couple of examples are they might have different fluid status or chronic inflammation. So these are the Kidoki guidelines for follow-up. I'm going to try to use this fancy spotlight tool. Uh-oh, what did I do? It's a cool spotlight. I know, but that's not... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me take it off. There we go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, but you know what? We learn something yeah. every day with telehealth. How to make your, dis your presentation disappear. <laughs> <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> I'll do that when I want people to focus only on my voice. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Follow the bouncing ball. <laughs> so this table is um, the recommendation for those follow-ups. So the frequency of nutrition assessment with children starting in CKD 2 through 5 and 5D, which is on dialysis. <clears throat> These are the minimal intervals recommended. And if you notice, it goes per age. So 0 to 1 years old is here. 1 to 3 is here and three and above is here. Each age has its own um, CKD stage, so two to three, four to five, or 5D dialysis. And then in this, uh, on the left side, it talks about which parameter we're gonna be assessing. So for example, dietary intake should be measured every two weeks to um, every three months in children zero to one. Obviously when they're younger, you're gonna see them much more often, sometimes weekly, to make sure that they're growing. And as you get older, <clears throat> These are just general recommendations, but you, you see them, you know, less frequently than you do when they're young and still growing rapidly. Height, um, the anthropometrics, so the height or length, height for age, weight, BMI, or weight for length. These kind of things we, in our clinic, try to do as often as possible, but these are the minimum intervals you want to be doing it. Um, so it's, you know, sometimes twice every two weeks. Um, to every two months maybe. Head circumference we do as often as possible in children until they hit the age of three. And this NPCR is basically um, for the dialysis population and if you notice they say it only applies to adolescents receiving hemodialysis. We actually check it in peritoneal and hemo kids of any age and it's supposed to be a good correlation to their protein intake. 
So that's what that is. The components of nutrition assessment, which I just mentioned, we can go into detail. Anthropometrics, so I'll collect their length or height. Their weight in dialyzed kids or anyone with edema, we try to estimate dry weight. Um, it's much easier in dialysis kids. <laughs> we do BMI or weight for length, head circumference. The type of dietary intake we're going to be doing, it's recommended for infants and children. You want to do a three-day food record. I'm going to take this off. Uh, I don't know, it didn't work. Three-day food records um, for infants and children. Since it's harder in adolescents to get them to write down what they're doing, they recommend three 24-hour recalls. We also collect biochemical data, for example, the NPCR, you know, CBC. Um, we also check their lipids and their iron stores. And based on all that information, I'll be able to develop um, interventions by calculating nutrient needs. So for the Kidoki guidelines, <clears throat> what they recommend is that most of these kids are going to need 100 to 100 percent of the DRI um, for protein and energy. But it's important to remember that the DRIs are based on a reference weight, which a lot of these kids do not achieve. So that's when your clinical ju judgment comes into play. If your kid is only half the reference weight, uh, you're not going to be able to achieve that amount of intake with them. But I still calculate it um, for comparison and kind of a goal. The macronutrient distribution is similar for kids with CKD or healthy, with the exception of the ones that get dyslipidemia. Micronutrients are usually at the DRI range and maybe a little below, and we'll get into that later. So the equations for estimating energy needs uh, <clears throat> in children that Kadoki uses are the same that you'll see in your um, little Pink Texas children's book. Uh, in my NKF nutrition assessment book, which I didn't bring, and I could, I could maybe scan that page, there is a special equation or an extra equation that they have for weight maintenance and overweight children. And um, I find it kind of overestimates a bit um, for weight maintenance. So do you use something else like, you know, in the, and we've talked about this reference guide a lot here. Um, do they, do you use like Schofield or something that tends to be underestimating in the average population? I don't. I do, I do these equations and then I compare it to the maintenance one and then I compare both of those to the DRI and kind of discuss what their goals are. So do they really want to maintain weight or not? And then I'll compare it to the diet analysis I do from their diet records to get an idea of where they would fall. Okay. So that's usually how I do it. Okay. <clears throat> and then there's some activity factors here that you want to put in depending on how active they are. A lot of kids will fall into the sedentary or low activity level, uh, especially once they hit CKD stage 3. They, Unless we're correcting their anemia really well, they're kind of lower energy. Um, but I do have, you know, really active adolescents where I might go up to the more than 60 minutes. But here's the equations. The macronutrient distribution, as I said, it's it's comparable to that of healthy children. Children, And in the, I think in a couple of slides, we'll talk about the differences um, when our children start developing dyslipidemia in the macronutrient distribution ranges we recommend. But, you know, mostly carbohydrate, moderate amount of fat, <coughs> and moderate amount of protein. Like with anyone, we recommend um, keeping dietary cholesterol as low as possible, eliminating trans fats if you can, saturated fats keep them down, and added sugars no more than 25% of total energy. This is very hard for the renal kids to achieve, especially when they're underweight, when we're telling them that all of their free foods are jams, syrups, jellies, and all these low potassium, low phosphorus foods. So keep that in mind. And the old thing this may have been before mm -hmm. when you started, but I was explaining to my children at home, we were having a dinner discussion about, in the old days, we used to give renal patients butter balls. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're still like, you know, get some olive oil. Yeah. yeah. That's still happening. But now that you can't give anybody saturated fat, right, yeah. <laughs> cholesterol, I guess the butter balls are out. I do a lot of put some olive oil on it. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of those recommendations. And we'll talk, like this slide right here talks specifically about the types of fats. So in the children with dyslipidemia, and it depends. So if they if they have high LDL alone or high triglycerides and high LDL, these are the recommendations. 
So dietary fat, less than 30%. Of course, cholesterol, we want to minimize as much as possible, but the maximum recommended is 200 milligrams a day. Avoid trans fat, saturated fat, less than 7%. Uh, carbohydrates for triglycerides, we recommend keeping low, low um, for the simple process kind of carbohydrates. So sugar, white breads, white tortillas, you know, the breakfast cereals, we recommend keeping that as low as possible. Down here, so these are American Heart Association tips. Um, reduce added sugars, and I know here at Envision we're always talking about get rid of the sweetened beverages. Uh, and then here's, speaking to Kirsten Bennett's butter balls, um, <laughs> the 21st <laughs> century <laughs> version. <laughs> <laughs> Canola oil, soybean oil, corn, or safflower oil. Um, so I wanted to ask you something in the fat category. Yeah. Um, the current fad, which I don't understand, so as another dietitian, maybe you can explain to me why mm -hmm. we're on this fad, the coconut Coconut fad. oil, yeah. So I just wondered if your patients are susceptible to that when you talk about the fat recommendations because mm -hmm. they are overly concerned than the general population about their nutritional health because they have a child with renal disease. Mm -hmm. So do you ever... Yeah, I get a lot of, you know, <clears throat> it's interesting, my CKD kids, uh, the really sick ones, the parents don't ask much about that, but like the hypertensive kids at risk, um, the solitary kidney kids at risk with the really involved parents, they do ask about, um, you know, Dr. Oz said this, Dr. Oz said that, uh, coconut oil. So we just talk about the amount of saturated fat that's in there. Uh -huh. It's extremely high oh, yeah. in saturated fat. And so I try to explain to them if... It's going to be solid in a jar at room temperature. Can you imagine what it's doing in your vessels? It's, you know, and that's kind of the approach we use. <laughs> good picture. So I tell them it doesn't, <laughs> Not a good picture. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it comes from an animal or the coconut. If it's saturated, it's something you need to limit. And we do have those discussions. Okay. Yeah. I just wondered, Nat, if, you know, it had worked its way into... Oh, yeah. And into that. everyone I work with asked me about it, too. So, yeah. Um, some other recommendations... Uh, to increase fruits and vegetables is if you must, of course, use frozen because it lasts longer, which I do personally. <laughs> uh, introduce fish regularly. And I always recommend doing it as young as possible so it's something they're used to. Use lean meats and low fat meats. Uh, limit high calorie things. So this is, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we have children with dyslipidemia who are actually trying to get to gain weight as well because they're, you know, they've been on prednisone and they're lucky enough to not gain a lot of weight with it but these are just general recommendations for dyslipidemia whole grains more legumes as far as their protein needs they're about 100 to 100 140 percent of the dra but it depends on stage so if you see right here ckd stage three it's 100 to 140 percent of the dra kids easily easily get this from my experience um once you move up in CKD status so as your kidney function declines you you know bring it down a little bit more towards the DRI once you hit the dialysis population their protein needs go up quite a bit you're gonna base that on their actual size so it's very individual and this is the grams per kilogram per day recommendations so can you tell us how the NPCR fits into this yeah so age here basically what we're doing in NPCR is we're, we're um, you know, if they still produce ur urine, we collect the urine so that we can test the nitrogen amount that's being excreted there. That gives us some amount of protein intake. Um, and then their BUN and creatinine. So it's it's a calculation they do to figure out what's your protein catabolism, which should equate to what you're eating, in theory. <laughs> and and you can see if, if it's based on protein catabolism and just the metabolites you're excreting, that there can be problem if it's a hypermetabolic kid or someone, you know, it doesn't always reflect exactly what they're eating, but it should basically, the values should basically match what they're getting. So an NPCR in my adolescent kiddos, I'm going to want it to be above one usually in the dialysis population. For the younger ones, I usually want it 1.2 or above. And that's, that's something that we kind of just track and trend to see if there's any significant changes, because if there is significant changes, we know either they're having fluid weight gain or they're actually not eating enough protein. So that's how that comes in, into play. Um, and as far as the extra protein for the hemo and peritoneal dialysis population, there's just a, a little uh, general recommendation here. They put a 0.1 gram per kilogram day to compensate for the dialytic losses. And there's more technical equations we can use, but I usually generally do, do this. 
Um, and then the peritoneal, it's 0.15 to 0.3 grams per kilogram. And there is a lot of um, research in adults with the lower protein intakes at the more advanced stages of renal failure. And I just went to a talk recently um, by a renal dietitian who was saying that when you do protein restriction, um, in children we don't ever recommend going below the DRI because they are growing. But when you do protein restriction, sometimes you need to couple it with amino acid supplementation, which sounds counterintuitive, <laughs> just to make sure they're getting the appropriate ratio of amino acids. And that can actually prolong the progression of the kidney failure, but it's something that definitely needs to be um, in a child that's going to be able to be monitored by a dietitian on a regular basis. So you haven't done that in the kids in terms of looking at amino acid profiles like you would in a child with metabolic disease. Because oh, that would give you... Yeah you know, an idea of if I'm giving whole protein, but when I do an amino acid profile, mm -hmm. I'm missing these, these things, ones. and those would be the ones that you would supplement. It. You're not doing that at this point, or are they doing that in the adult population? They do that, yeah, they do that stuff for research on the adult population. Okay. I do have one child now whose mom significantly restricts her protein, and um, I'm actually having her do a food record, and after I look at that, we're going to decide whether or not we want to order some sort of blood work too. Mm -hmm make sure she's you know ckd stage five but not dialysis and she either needs a transplant soon or something has to be done so to assist her in her efforts we're trying to help her with her nutritional goals so but that that would be something that i would definitely do if more kids restricted and i she's the only one of my patients so far that does a low protein diet um, protein intake so the kidoki guidelines recommend uh, mixed mixed protein from plant and animal sources, but with the emphasis on plant protein. The reason for that is that whenever we think of protein, we got to think of phosphorus because they come together. But in plant proteins, the phosphorus is less absorbed, so the bioavailability is lower. So, uh, and another, I guess the other side of that coin is that the animal protein is going to have the higher biological value protein. So that's why it's important to kind of have the mixture. The ratio, so on the next slide, I'm going to show you this handout. Uh, it talks about the ratio of how many milligrams of phosphorus for every gram of protein are in different types of foods. Okay. So these ratios basically say if it's a lower ratio, you're having more phosphorus for every milligram of protein. So to give you an example, one large egg has 86 milligrams of phosphorus and it has 6 grams of protein. So the ratio... Um, is 1.4. So you actually only absorb about 60 milligrams of phosphorus and 5.7 grams of that protein. So you're absorbing most of the protein, some less phosphorus. In sunflower seeds, you have a lot more phosphorus, 322 milligrams for the 6 grams of protein. But you only absorb about 161, so about half of that phosphorus is actually being absorbed. And this kind of just gives you an idea of why we recommend more plant sources of um, protein, it's because you're still getting a good source of protein, but less of that phosphorus with it. Was that a good explanation of that, do you think? So go back to your slide with the seeds. <laughs> <laughs> so they have more phosphorus, but if you get, for six grams of protein, and that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, and... The, and you get more phosphorus from the six grams of protein that you got in the sunflower seeds than mm -hmm. you get from the six grams of protein that you got from the egg. So help me understand why I would want to eat sunflower seeds. Well, actually... <laughs> Besides see, the fact that yeah. sunflower seeds are nice to throw on a salad. Throw on a salad, <laughs> yeah. I use those just because they're most extreme examples oh, okay. of handout. But um, I guess lentils and beans would be a better one. It's just more of a thing to, to point out that... There's different protein digestibility and there's different phosphorus digestibility. And if you have a mixture, if I guess I should have used meat as an example. You're going to absorb all the phosphorus you eat from meat. Okay. So if we're having 10 or 12 ounces of meat a day, you're going to be absorbing all of the phosphorus from it. Whereas the digestibility from the plant, like the nuts, seeds, and legumes, is lower. And I don't... This was from the vegetarian... I don't have any vegetarian renal patients, but it might have been something where they just decided to do the research to actually compare it to make sure that the recommendations for following a... But you don't have to push renal. somebody, though. It, no. I guess is what you're saying is that there's not um, a benefit to pushing a patient one way or the other in terms of being a vegan. No, definitely assuming. not. 
an animal or so you, your patients aren't going to feel torn between no one way and another because they're I never be yeah advantage. I never recommend a specific way of eating <laughs> I kind of whatever they eat we kind of figure out how much phosphorus they're actually getting for it but the main thing is to, to compare the bioavailability of the phosphorus in these products. And mainly it's because of the fiber content and the phosphate binding with the oxalates, I think. For vitamin and mineral needs, um, it's suggested that supplementation is done in CKD, just CKD stages 2 to 5 only if they cannot meet 100% of the DRA needs orally or if you have some clinical or physical evidence of a deficiency. And you can, you know, confirm these by checking blood work or doing nutrition-focused physical exams. In the dialysis patient, it's different. We do recommend that they supplement water-soluble because they're losing stuff during treatment, either in the peritoneal or the hemodialysis treatment. Um, once you start supplementing, different concerns come into play. For young, inf for young children and infants, you can actually go over that upper limit very easy, especially with the vitamins and supplements that are available. So this might require that you do something like partial dosing every other day dosing or just a couple times a week. Um, in adolescents, it's much easier. We usually give them a half a dose of an adult like nephrovite or something like that, and we don't experience any kind of um, toxicity levels. And also, renal vitamins will not have, um, you know, they have the Bs and the Cs, sometimes some antioxidants, but they have the water-soluble vitamins, not the fat-soluble vitamins. As far as the trace elements, um, I thought I would put this in here to just point out that not, not every renal kid needs low potassium, low sodium, low phosphorus diet. If you're an infant on PD, you're going to need more sodium and more potassium in general because you're growing and you're losing a lot of it. Or polyuric children, so um, someone that has um, any kind of kidney disease that's calling, causing them to pee frequently and drink a lot, they usually waste a lot of potassium and a lot of sodium and we're having to replace that. Where on the other end, children with hypertension or prehypertension might need restrictions of sodium. And any child that has edema, and we have to figure out what's causing it, they may need fluid and sodium restriction or just a fluid restriction. And if they do not have any more native kidneys, so the children on dialysis with double nephrectomies, they usually have pretty strict fluid restrictions so that they're not gaining a lot of weight in between treatments. Uh, and as far as the potassium um, supplementation, it's usually recommended to use an actual prescription. And the same thing with sodium. Sometimes we do have people putting salt um, into the formula on occasion, but the Kidoki guidelines recommend um, that you actually use something that you're going to be getting from a pharmacy, so potassium chloride or something. Like that. I do have several kids um, with different, like Barrett's or something that I have on really really high potassium diets, so they're the opposite of the kids on dialysis. This is just a table that shows the DRA in healthy children. Okay, so there wasn't a specific one for CKD because, or dialysis, because that's going to be dependent on every individual. And usually, you know, I'll be doing these calculations based on how many milliequivalents per kilogram they can, they can handle for their age. But it just gives you ideas for general water recommendations. It's important to remember in children they do need sodium to grow. I know in adults we're always trying to keep it as low as possible. And as I said, keep in mind if you have any child that's wasting or poly, polyuria, all three of these um, sometimes need to be supplemented. And then the upper limits here. So sodium in my dialysis kit, we keep around here, 1500 milligrams is the max usually that we recommend. And that's just to prevent the fluid retention. Uh, in my hypertensive kids, it's the same recommendation. But sometimes in my PD infants, um, even though they're only, you know, 7 to 12 months, we have them doing 1,200 milligrams a day because they waste so much. We do not actually collect their urine and test how much they're wasting. It's more of a, are they growing, are they not growing, do we need to supplement, and what are their blood chemistry show us? That's kind of how we assess that. Um, I just want to point out a few things. As far as um, vitamins and minerals in these 
kiddos, when you get um, kidney failure, your kidney function starts to decline. The retinal binding protein, which carries vitamin A, and vitamin A can start accumulating in your body. <clears throat> this is one of the reasons those um, renal vitamins do not contain vitamin A in them. So we do not recommend supplementation with like a regular Flintstone or something in anyone that's about CKD3 or above. Unless you can um, do some blood work and you're having clinical symptoms of um, deficiency, then you need to do blood work to confirm and then you can safely substitute at a low or supplement at a low level. Other antioxidants, I try to look at the research to see how much these are actually pulled off during dialysis. In general, kids with um, chronic inflammation and chronic diseases, they have a lower antioxidant status in the first place, so we recommend, you know, getting that from the diet. I didn't see that it was taken off. Um, I had changed this. I guess this was in the... I'm, I'll have to give you the updated version. It's not removed. Vitamin E isn't removed, but some of the other antioxidants like selenium can be removed during dialysis. The main problem, though, is that um, they get a low dietary intake, and that's why they have a low status. Currently, we don't recommend um, supplementing these specifically, like on their own. If it's uh, a child that's before CKD stage 3, they're usually going to be getting it from a multivitamin, and if they have a decent amount of um, plant foods, because a lot of the, the, like the selenium is in the soil. So I know that, that vitamin E is not included in my nephrovitamins. Um, another concern with children with um, chronic kidney disease is mineral and bone metabolism. So vitamin D and parathyroid hormone are something we're always looking at <clears throat> almost every month in these kiddos. The parathyroid hormone's function is to control the balance of calcium and phosphorus in your blood and in your bone. When you have kidney function that starts to decline, um, some other things go with it. Sometimes you have overproduction of PTH, which in turn is going to increase your absorption of the calcium and phosphorus in the gut, increasing your serum levels. And then also vitamin D, which is usually activated in a healthy kidney, is part of what helps regulate the parathyroid hormone. And when you get a dysfunction, it is no longer able to do its job of regulating the parathyroid hormone. So I just put a little blurb in here. Um, another thing that happens in the CKD kids is, so phosphorus and calcium can bind together and create this insoluble complex. So when you're doing a blood chemistry on someone, they might actually have a lot of phosphorus and calcium, but what's happened is it's formed this insoluble complex, and this is when you start seeing the deposits in the soft tissue, like the cardiovascular system. And it's usually at the expense of the health of their bones, and that's part of the reason why they develop this bone mineral metabolism, is that these things are in high concentration in the blood, they're forming insoluble complexes and not doing their job in the bone. It ends up, usually what ends up happening is our kiddos show they have a low calcium level, um, and this, re you know, it stimulates PTH, which then stimulates the osteoclast breakdown of your bone to release more calcium into the blood. And so a lot of our kids, you know, get a lot of broken bones. They don't grow very well. They definitely don't reach their genetic potential and height. So what we do for monitoring, and these are some recommendations that you could easily do in a general clinic, is you want to check their um, vitamin D levels. If it's less than 30 nanograms per milliliter, you can supplement um, with vitamin D2, which is easy to get over the counter. If it's... Um, above a certain level and you're supplementing but the, PCH, the PTH is still really high, we give a little bit more vitamin D to help regulate the PTH more. And you can either do cholecalciferol or calcitriol. And that's more of a price thing. The cholecalciferol is going to be cheaper than the calcitriol. And then, of course, you're always going to have to be doing the diet history to get an idea of what they're actually eating. If you can control the amount of phosphorus they're eating, it's going to be less exacerbated. And I feel, I really feel for these kids because I know we're pumping tons of calcitriol in them to bring their PTH down. And it does not surprise me when they come back the next month with a high phosphorus because it's helping them absorb this calcium and phosphorus. And then we have to restrict their diet a little bit more, which is really hard to do. Here's the um, recommendation or the breakdown for if it's a deficiency, a mild deficiency, or if they have sufficient amounts of vitamin D. 
And then the Kadoki guidelines for supplementation and the duration you want to do that for before you recheck. These are the um, recommendations for the phosphorus and calcium intake. So if I have a, a kid that comes in with a normal parathyroid hormone and normal phosphorus, they basically get the DRI value. But if they have high PTH and high phosphorus, we need to restrict that. It's usually around an 80% restriction, and it says it right here. It's usually about 80% of the DRI, and it really depends. If they have one or the other, sometimes I, I work with them every month to flux how much they can actually eat. <laughs> The calcium intake, um, once you start giving, usually most kids in general don't get enough calcium, right? That's our main concern. Um, but when it does become a concern to me is when we're giving them a lot of TOMS or kind of calcium-based binders, then we have to make sure that they're not overdoing it from dietary or these binder sources. You know, our favorite thing, of course, is to cut down the amount of pills they have to eat. So we'll, we'll sometimes just switch to a non-calcium binder like Rena Gel. And right now we're doing, a, Dr. Wong's doing a study for validating Renvella in children, which is just the, it's the carbonate version of the Renvella, so it's the non-acidic, it's the alkaline version of this non-calcium-based binder. So a lot of times we'll just switch to that to bring their calcium into range. These are just some values, so if you're going to be checking their PTH, what you want to expect, uh, just notice here in the dials, the CKD stage 5 in dialysis population, their value range is higher. <clears throat> but in, in 4 and below, basically want it to be around what would be normal for their age. And then these are the values that you might expect to see um, for ionized calcium, total calcium, and phosphorus in your CKD population. It's a little bit different than other children. I think our range, you know, we're a little bit lenient. We go 5.5 even all the way up to our 20 year olds <laughs> in the dialysis population. But it's age based. So in your younger kids, you're going to expect them to have a much higher phosphorus naturally than you are in your older kids. I just wanted to put some few slides about special considerations in these kiddos. Male nutrition is a big one. Um, a lot of them just do not have the appetite to sustain proper nutrition, and as a result, they get poor growth. Um, usually they have really short stature compared to um, kids their age or even their siblings. Like, we have a lot of twins, and one's literally half the size of their twin, which is really hard for them to see. And then they do develop social delays, and we'll talk about reasons for that. The male nutrition, like I said, it's very common. It's usually due to inadequate intake. They have uh, anorexia associated with uremic um, states. They do get some taste changes. A lot of my dialysis kids especially, they just do not like the taste of meat and they do not like the taste of things. And I don't know if that's part of their treatment, but it does happen quite frequently. And then they have a lot of GI issues. GERD in infants is a really big problem in general, but it seems to be exacerbated, especially in the peritoneal kids who are full of fluid all day long. A lot of them get constipation. Sometimes they're so constipated we have to bring them in to clean them out. We do do Miralax, like a daily thing for these kiddos. But, I mean, could you imagine being constipated and full of a day 12 PD fluid? They are not hungry and they do not want to eat. And it's understandable. A lot of our other kids, you know, they might have the opposite problem where they have diarrhea all the time. And it's really important, I think, to ask about what the poop is like because we have a lot of parents that think... <laughs> their child's having diarrhea and really they're constipated and the feces is having to force its way around and it seems like it's diarrhea but really they're having constipation and that's the main issue so I'm always asking what's the poop like what stomach noises do they make you know is it like a number two pencil is it little balls everything <laughs> I get as much info as I can because I have noticed in a lot of these kids where for months we've been thinking they had diarrhea we figure we'll give them a GR referral I think it's constipation we clean them out and all of a sudden they eat a lot better. So I'm sure you guys have experienced that in general population. Poor growth in stature. A lot of this is due to the fact that um, it's not that they don't make enough growth hormone, it's that their body does not respond to it appropriately and it kind of reminds me of insulin sensitivity. What's happening is you're having end organ or um, resistance to the growth hormone and part of that is because there's a growth hormone binder that mimics it and it binds to these sites so it's it's binding up and taking the space, but not functioning like a growth hormone would. 
So to overcome this, what we do is we give them uh, really high doses of growth hormone to help them grow. It's most effective before the age of two. We do it as long as our bone age shows that the kid is still able to grow. So if they're in adolescence with a young bone age and there's still potential, we give them growth hormone. Um, if it's, sadly, this happens a lot, a girl who's had her menses for two years already, there's not much hope. And we do have those kids that present to us, you know, past the ability to actually use growth hormone. An important thing I want to point out is that it requires adequate, adequate substrate. So I can give a kid growth hormone every day, but if they're not getting calories and protein and the substrate isn't there to grow, they're not going to grow. And this is one of the things we're always having to remind the parents of. They think, okay, we're starting growth hormone, we're not going to be as strict with the tube feeding, and they're not growing, and we're not surprised. Um, and these, these poor kiddos, this involves injections six out of seven days of the week for most of our kids, so they have to get needle sticks most of the time. The social delays, um, you know, and I'm no expert on this, but just from my experiments, um, my experience is that a lot of these kids are treated like the sick kid in the family, or even at school, you know, they're not allowed to play recess because they're seen as fragile, maybe. And they get, you know, this creates social isolation for a lot of them. And when we're trying to transition them after transplant, for example, back to a normal life, especially getting them off of the G-tube feedings, it's really hard for them. And it's a big kind of distressing thing for them psychologically. On top of that, they're out of school so much that a lot of our kids, I notice, are in special education or they're a year or two behind what they should be. And when you meet them, they're very bright, um, intelligent kind of kiddos. And, you know, it, it, I feel for them, but they, they kind of start developing like, well, I don't want to go to school because I have to go and I'm behind and I'm in a special education class. And so I do notice <coughs> that with some of our kids as well. And, you know, I point this out because in general, and I'm always, I'm always preaching this to the families, is if your kid is fed really well and exercised well, they do so much better on their treatment and they are out of school less often. <laughs> so that's another reason why nutrition activity is so important. So are there questions that anyone wants me to go back to any slides on before we wrap up? All right, so I'll do a summary. Um, yeah. oh. oh, go, go ahead, yes. Um, you were talking, and I'm sorry, I don't have a medical background, but I have a child in my child care center who has a genetic uh, kidney disease that has uh, changed her diet to a vegan diet. Okay. Um, according to the family, that's their preference. And one okay. of the things that she's been drinking uh, is coconut milk because they don't want her drinking regular milk. And I was wondering, is that recommended? I don't know a lot of her details about her dietary limits or what her levels are, but I just I had heard you talk a lot about calcium, and so I didn't know if we needed to be looking at that. Oh, that's a great question, and I get that question a lot. And sadly, coconut milk is one of the highest sources of potassium and I think it has phosphorus, too. I just looked at all these recently. <clears throat> the only milk And that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very high. And the only milk... So I looked about six months ago. I harassed all these companies. I called them. I asked them if they test the phosphorus and potassium and calcium and sodium and what they were. The only dairy substitute I found that um, was that... And I can, I can send you these, you know, or we can post them on the website later. The only one I found that is okay for my kids that are you know, having high levels of potassium and phosphorus was this silk pure almond milk. And that also included okay. their chocolate milk, which they could have like, you know, three or four times a week, or they ha could have one glass of the um, silk almond pure. But the coconut milks were all extremely high. The rice milks, which we used to tell everyone to drink, now have potassium phosphate added to them as a preservative. Mm -hmm. And they are extremely high in phosphorus and potassium. But like on the flip side okay. of that, I found that the rice ice cream, because it's frozen, they do not add the potassium phosphate to it, and that was okay. So it takes a lot of investigation, and if you're noticing that there's any kind of really high levels of potassium and phosphorus, and the phosphorus is really going to inhibit their bone growth, so it is something the parents have to be aware of. And it's, you know, if they want to do a vegan diet, they're going to have to plan it extremely well. Um, but... It would be good to get a diet intake on that kiddo and then assess it, probably. Unfortunately, I was just yeah. doing a quick Well, we've done really good in our facility of 
supporting her, uh, but I like the idea about the reducing the added sugars and ch- checking our oils and things like that because those are important things I think we can do in our facility to support her. So, yeah, I mean, I you can definitely support them in their efforts and just just make them aware that even a healthy child on a vegan diet needs to have a very well planned diet, and if they're you know what you would consider a quote unquote picky eater. Or anything like that the parents are going to have to be extra careful about providing them the nutrients they need for normal brain development normal cognition normal bone growth all that kind of stuff exactly thank you yeah you're welcome thanks for the question does anyone else have questions It's just amazing how much fats and coconut yeah. milk. Yeah, Kirsten Bennett looked up the fat content. It was like 56 oh grams of fat I mean, for one cup. One cup <laughs> No, they do of make... Co- oh, yeah, most, it's, most and, of the and coconut 200 milk to is four defatted. Most, Keep that in mind. Like those big jugs you see of coconut yeah. milk on the shelves, they are defatted most of the time. The ones they make for drinking milk. The ones in the cans, okay, so here's fat. One. Yeah, yeah the ones in the cans. So those are the canned ones. So now uh-huh. here's one that's... That's for cakes. Yeah. Trust Lech has cakes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, someone asked me once, you know, why... Um, popcorn at the movie theater tasted so good. Coconut. Well, because it's made with coconut oil, and yeah. and so when you, I don't know if they do this anymore, but it used to come in a chunk. Yeah. Because it's solid at room temperature, and huh. they throw it in that, you know, oh. the little popper, and it, and that's why it tasted so good. And you didn't usually get that. It's also not very shelf stable, so it's not one of those things that people were eating, but I've just noticed this huge craze toward using coconut. My, mm-hmm. I noticed when I was visiting my mom that she had some there, and I'm like, why do you have that? She goes, oh, your sister brought that. She thought it would be healthy for us, and I'm like... You know, and all the research on the specific fats in there is still 50-50. It, you, you just only want to have it in moderation if you're going to eat it, but not something you're doing a lot of every day. And there are quite a bit of diet books on the shelves at the bookstores. The coconut cure, all these kind of things about <laughs> eating tons and tons of coconut. So, it is a fad. I do get asked a lot about stuff like that. I want a chocolate cure. A chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Eat chocolate for all your dietary troubles. For, for all your dietary <laughs> troubles. Well, I suppose if you mix them with things, you know. Yeah. Chocolate covered broccoli. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> pure cocoa powder if you can. Chocolate almonds. Yeah, there you go. But well, just the cocoa powder, yeah. not any of the other stuff. Just sprinkle dark chocolate cocoa powder. Yeah, the things. dark chocolate is can be beneficial. On small so there you go. On a regular basis. The Mediterranean <laughs> diet: mix cocoa powder with small olive amounts. oil and spread it liberally. Actually, that could be good. If it's yeah. something. <laughs> Toast or something. All right. So just to summarize, um, I want to remind you guys that kidney disease in children is most often the cause of genetic abnormalities. And the reason I put this in so many times is because a lot, a lot of my kiddos. Um, the, what would you call them, like the cafeteria staff and stuff, sometimes they have these, you know, ideas because of family or what they've been exposed to that you're going to have diabetes if you're someone with kidney disease or something, and they've tried to put limitations on what kids eat in the school system. I have noticed that quite a bit. So when I write letters with diets, I say, you know, it's important to remember that, you know, if they have diabetes, that's one thing, but a lot of times they don't. Um, assessing the nutritional status and growth is definitely a challenge. It requires getting to know the individual and their family pretty well, um, foster parents if they're with caregivers. And like I like I said, all those predictive equations and the DRIs, those are based on reference weights, so that's something that's very important to keep in the back of your mind. And as a result of that, every individual needs a nutrition um, plan that is specific to them and their needs that's going to promote optimal growth and development for that kid because our main goal is to get them transplanted and transition them to normal functioning adults. So. I put some references here. If you want to look up, um, this is the website for all the community <coughs> guidelines. So this includes adults. There's a section in there specifically about nutrition and children, which is where my recommendations came from. Uh, this book, um, the Nutrition Therapy for Chronic Kidney Disease, goes through all life cycles, and it has a really good chapter in there. It just came out in 2012. It's excellent. And then uh, there's an article here. If you want to learn a little bit more about the growth hormone metabolism changes in the CKD kids, I liked that. It was an up-to-date article. It was pretty good and succinct.
Does anyone have any additional questions or comments before we go to our case? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. Um, can you go over the uh, phosphorus to protein ratio again? Oh, okay. Let's see, where's my... So this slide? Or the one before, where you had the egg in the... Yeah, this seat. is the, my, I guess, sad attempt at an explanation of this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. So what did you have a, a specific question on it? Um, can you just so, tell me that I missed, missed out a portion of it? Okay, so this slide here is just like I said, it's an attempt to to de describe the um, table here. So if you look at okay. look at so on the left hand column is your food, in the middle is the ratio of phosphorus to the grams of protein that's just available in that food. On the right column is the ratio of what you would actually absorb. Uh, so the bioavailability is reflected here. So if I was going to eat an egg white, every gram of protein um, is going to have basically like 1.4 grams of phosphorus in it. And I'm only going to absorb one. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. For every gram of protein, I'm absorbing one milligram of phosphorus. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And um, so in egg whites and meats and tofu has a pretty high bioavailability in eggs I'm absorbing most of the phosphorus I'm eating and then if you notice once you get into the plant foods you absorb less of the phosphorus that's in the food okay. you still absorb quite a bit but it's less yeah okay milk has a pretty good bioavailability as well it's funny that all these foods are like <laughs> really high examples. Like there wouldn't be ones you would pick or they would be ones that you would pick? Well, you know... If you were to make your own chart. Oh, if I were to make my own chart, you know what I would probably do is do one of all the different meats. Like chicken is one of the highest sources of phosphorus and potassium and the reason why is they inject it or they put it in their feed. Um, and it's really sad because I just had a kid the other day, she was like, I thought I was doing good for my body choosing chicken instead of beef. But actually, it would be better for her if she chose the beef burger at McDonald's than the chicken sandwich because it's going to have a lot less potassium. So I think, and I could I could do that too. That would be good for my patients yeah. mm -hmm. and this, and we can put it on the website. I think I'd probably break down all the different meats um, to compare what you're getting because this is the one thing that you will hear either in adult centers or pediatric dialysis centers. We're always trying to get kids to eat more protein. And a lot of times they get the idea that they can have as much meat as they want and that's not contributing to their phosphorus load. In reality it is. These other things, you know, are the, some of the highest sources of phosphorus and that's probably why they included it here. Is so that you can see these are all really high phosphorus foods if you look at a generic renal diet list. However, what you're actually getting out of them is different. And of course it's going to depend on your serving size, right? So when you talked about your patient example about using beef instead of chicken, wouldn't that be better too if they have sort of this chronic anemia? Anemia, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them are on a lot of ferrous sulfate every day, um, and that's usually the go-to treatment before just trying to get it dealt with dietary-wise. But I do talk to them about you know, the different nutrients and different foods and what you're getting out of each. And it's all about teaching people. It's like teaching someone how to budget. You have so much to work with every day and you have to make sure you don't go over or run out of something. <laughs> did that answer your question at all or did I just confuse you more? Um, it makes sense now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, 